Mary? I can now, yes. I had to put my love bird in the other room. Huh? I had to move all the, I had to roll the pigeons out, and now I have the canary who decided it's time to sing and not stop. Oh, my God. I can know. Well, it's appropriate. It is. It's a good group for that to happen. Yeah, it, it, yes, it'll give it a little, um, you know, authenticity then. Yeah. So pigeons going, <laughs> canary singing. <laughs> well, I want to go ahead and say welcome and hello. I'm Robin with Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, and I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to bring this presentation to you and hope that it's really interactive. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to first go over some general housekeeping tips with you. First, we are recording this session. So if there's information you would like to listen to again or other members of your, your team that you think would benefit from this information, we will send you the link to this recording after the webinar. So you can feel free to access that at any time. If you're having technical issues, please feel free to use the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen and let me know. Um, and I'll try to help you out via the chat box. If you happen to be on the phone only and you're having trouble getting into the internet portion, feel free to send me an email to robin at sanctuaryfederation.org, and that's R-O-B-I-N, and I'll help you out via email. You can definitely stay on the phone and, and listen while we do that. <clears throat> and again, if you have technical questions, please feel free to use the chat in the, on the left-hand side of your screen to um, ask those. Um, also, we wanted to mention this is an open forum, so we definitely want to encourage your questions. Um, the presentation is set to start with a number of the questions that you submitted during the registration process, but we hope that inspires mm -hmm. you to ask some more questions during the presentation, and we will try to address as many of those as we can, so please definitely feel free to use that. So now I will go ahead and pass this over to Kelly Heckman, who will get us started. Kelly is the Executive Director of DFAS, and Kelly, you can go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you. I will... Oops. So, yeah, welcome to oh. our first of two um, avian protection roundtable uh, events. Um, we have today's, and then we also will have one next week. Today we're focusing on those groups that are just starting or are maybe contemplating the start of an avian program at their animal shelter or um, maybe doing some development at a rescue group. Um, and, you know, I'm the, as Robin said, I'm the executive director of Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. And for those of you who may have not heard about our work, uh, we're an international accreditation organization that evaluates sanctuaries, rescue centers, and rehabilitation centers all over the world. And unfortunately, as a lot of us may have experienced uh, firsthand, not all of facilities providing care for captive animals are equal. There's varying degrees of quality of care and organizational structure, but you know that gives us an opportunity for a lot of improvement. Oops. Um, so as I mentioned, we're primarily an accreditation uh, program as part of our mission, but we recognize excellence among the sanctuaries and rescue groups as part of that. And we also want to engage with those that are not accredited to improve the care of animals, public safety, and sustainability of the organizations as well. And we promote the development of these organizations through educational opportunities such as today's webinar, which supports organizations' abilities to meet and exceed the standards that we have. And we also seek to eliminate the cause of displaced captive animals through our public outreach. And we use to, uh, opportunities like today's webinar, which is being attended by you know, quite an eclectic group of people representing a variety of interests to share the challenges of animal displacement. And we hope to increase awareness of the issues and reduce the need for sanctuaries and rescues in the future, but also make sure the animals receive care they deserve in the short term. For us, our objective is sponsoring this series of webinars is first to provide you with the necessary information to provide short-term care for the birds that come to you in need. And you know, as Robin mentioned, to make this as useful to you as possible, and again, this is a round table, please ask questions. Um, many of you actually submitted questions already when you 
uh, as part of the registration format. But uh, and so we have, you know, present, you know, we already have some that we're ready to address as part of a, more of a kind of formal presentation. But you know, as Dr. Pilney is actually going through, the, um, you know, what we've already prepared, please continue to ask questions. Or you know, if it inspires you to ask a question regarding some other topic, um, put it in in the chat box, and I will kind of moderate to kind of make sure that we get to as many topics as possible. And I also want to take this opportunity to just point out, you know, again, we're not going to get to every question. We're not going to cover every topic today. We're really kind of focusing on those early stages of program, uh, you know, coming together from scratch. So I want to point out a few resources. First of all, from GFAS, uh, our website, sanctuaryfederation.org, you can download all of our animal standards, uh, which includes uh, bird standards, uh, we have three different bird groups that we kind of give standards for individually. Um, a lot of you had questions about adoption and placement. And number one, I want to you know, call attention to the fact that we had a webinar series last year. And the third of that series of three uh, specifically was dealing with adoption and placement issues. So revisit that. But then I also want to say that you know, given the demand that you guys um, you know, expressed in your registrations that we will be coming back to that topic probably within the next month or two. So stay tuned for that. We'll send out emails when we get that already. And then, of course, you know, we got also a lot of questions about funding. Uh, I just wanted to point out a few resources that are kind of about animal sheltering in general, which does include um, funding but also other operational uh, questions. And ASPCA Pro and AnimalSheltering.org are really valuable kind of general resources in that regard. And then, of course, for issues specific to avian um, welfare, there's always the Avian Welfare Coalition, which, again, partnered with us on this um, presentation series, and uh, which gives me a great segue to hand it over to Denise Kelly, who is with Avian Welfare Coalition. And... Um, Denise is president. I'll give you just a tiny bit of intro. President and co-founder of Animal uh, Avian Welfare Coalition, and uh, which was formed in 2000 in order to raise awareness about the plight of parrots and other captive birds. And I just want to emphasize one of the resources that they have is cap is a handbook, Captive Exotic Bird Care: A Guide for Shelters, which is a, an amazing resource that they put together and is available for you. But from there, I'll let Denise kind of take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining us for this second webinar series. Um, some of you were here with us last year. And to you newcomers, we're welcome to have you. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Kelly, a very special thanks to Kelly and Robin Mason from and the Global Federation for working with us to coordinate this presentation. Um, as Kelly said, AWC was formed in 2000 to create a voice in the animal protection community for parrots and other captive birds and to raise awareness to the issues associated with captive bird welfare. Um, we serve as an educational resource for the animal protection community, lawmakers, and the general public. Um, one of our key concerns when we formed the organization was to address the needs of, of displaced parrots. And with that, we had two goals in mind. One was to improve the standards of care for birds in shelters, temporary shelters, and permanent sanctuary. And two, to engage with the animal sheltering community and utilize the multitude of resources that they offered in an effort to widen our reach and help more birds in need. Um, recognizing also that most cat and dog animal shelters shelters already face enormous challenges and were not necessarily equipped to deal with birds, uh, which uh, caused us to found our avian outreach initiative that was designed specifically to provide animal shelters with the tools to help them help birds. Uh, Kelly mentioned it started with our publication of our handbook, which is a 112-page guide, uh, Captive Exotic Bird Care, a Guide for Shelters. We also did present at avian care, our avian care workshops 
at shelters and humane conferences. We've done that over the years. Um, we developed a series of free downloadable how-to guides available on our website at avianwelfare.org backslash shelters. All 16 address specific topics on caring for birds in the shelters. And finally, partnering uh, this amazing opportunity with the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries to bring these necessary resources online via these avian care webinar series. For those of you who were not with us for last year's three-part webinar series, Caring for Exotic Birds in the Shelter, I really recommend that you visit the Global Federation's avian education page to view all three. Um, in planning this year's series, um, we wanted to create this more interactive forum where shelter workers and volunteers could get answers to their specific questions. We considered the feedback we received to last year's series on topics that viewers indicated they wanted more information on, and also through the registration questionnaire that you completed this year, which also enabled us to focus in on what you considered to be the most challenging aspects of your bird care program. Note that all of these initiatives are intended to serve as guidelines for caring for birds in the short term in shelters and other animal care facilities. Um, Global Federation um, and AWC support higher standards of care for permanent sanctuaries and in private homes. And as Kelly has already summarized, the accreditation by GFAS is a meticulous process and is intended to provide accountability along all aspects of animal care and husbandry. Our purpose in presenting these webinars is simply to better prepare facilities that care for birds in the short-term setting and to help keep those birds as safe and comfortable as possible during their stay. I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Anthony Pilney, who is an amazing advocate for birds, uh, for captive birds, and I think you'll agree after this um, presentation. And I believe his bio is up on the screen right now. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pilney. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. And I appreciate all the work and efforts through the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and through the Avian Welfare Coalition in allowing me here today to speak on this topic as, as we all work together and continue to bring more awareness to an issue that we all certainly wish we didn't have to deal with. And that has to do with pet relinquishment. And specific to birds, what are we doing and how are we dealing with issues relating to the unprecedented number of unwanted birds? Unfortunately, there are places for them to go. There are not places for them to go. And in other situations, places for them to go are no longer able to take them in. So we've been working on this initiative for quite some time, and as you've heard Denise say, to bring awareness to the needs of birds in the short-term shelter care situation. What we're looking at is how can we help and structure animal shelters to be able to take in unwanted pet birds and be able to care for them until we can come up with a more permanent plan. And that leads through to a, a number of different complex issues and a number of concerns, which we'll address today in this webinar discussion. As you see here, there is a general outline of what we'll be talking about as we go through. You've heard from the other speakers already to please list your questions and please list any comments or concerns, and we'll try to address those as we work our way through. Now, one disclaimer, as you saw in the earlier slide, is everything we talk about is related to parrots or pet birds and working with them in the shelter situation. So when we talk about planning, we're talking about equipping a shelter to start taking in birds. And I realize some of you may already be doing this and some of you may be in the stages of contemplating whether this is something your shelter will be able to do. What we have to consider in this question is what is the first thing to address when starting an avian shelter program? And this, like most of the questions, is very complicated and has a number of other sub-questions. 
But the correct answer really is, can it be done? Is it really feasible? Is it really possible? Is the shelter or the environment that you want to start receiving these homeless birds in going to actually be able to house them, care for them, provide for their short-term needs, and be able to do right by these animals. We're talking about an enormous amount of support, which is probably the second most important thing to address when starting a shelter program. Do we have the volunteers? Do we have the interest? Do we have the support of the shelter itself for the allocation of space? Are they willing to utilize their resources that are available, as well as the hot topic funding? Is the money there? Is the support there? Are they willing to pay staff to assist? How are we going to work through starting this shelter program when we think about the absolute feasibility or the possibility of setting up a shelter program? Now, many people that have successfully done this have realized that some parts of it are very simple and some parts of it are exceedingly difficult. I had mentioned a little bit earlier that those established sanctuary type places that have taken in unwanted birds um, have worked through a lot of these issues, but a lot of those are currently full or unable to take in any more birds. So as we continue to deal with the numbers of unwanted birds, we need another place for them to go. So planning this out is really, really important and really key to this. Webinars like this, other online resources like that through the Avian Welfare Coalition's guidebook and other shelters that are successfully doing this, as well as sanctuaries and rescue organizations, can also help advise in the planning. But overall, we're looking at the considerations of what it takes to do it and whether it's really something that's going to be able to happen. It takes teamwork, it takes cooperation, and it takes a lot of thought and planning from a lot of different people to pull it off. Now this changes gears a little bit, and this is a very complicated topic when we're looking at the needs of unreleasable pigeons and doves specifically, but when we're looking at unreleasable wildlife in general. Now this in itself could be an entire webinar discussion because we have to look at several factors. One of those are federal and state laws regulating care of wildlife. I personally am a licensed New York State wildlife rehabilitator. I have spent many, many years doing an extensive amount of wildlife rehabilitation. I don't do as much as I used to, but I am still actively involved and maintain my license each year. And on a personal note, I am um, home to two unreleasable pigeons that currently live with me. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with this situation as well as working with a number of, of wildlife rehabilitators and a number of, being in New York City, pigeon rescuers who deal with this situation, which is what do we do with an unreleasable wild bird or specific to this pigeon or dove and mostly pigeons when they can't be released, but there's nowhere for them to go. And like I said, we have to refer to state and local laws. And speaking for New York State, the laws are very clear. In New York State, an animal that's classified as wildlife, and I realize there are some semantics about whether pigeons and some other birds are truly classified as wildlife, but to keep it simple, we do consider them wildlife. What to do with them when they are rescued and when they are rehabilitated and cannot be released. And the issue really relates to New York state law, in my particular experience, is that if they can't be released, they're supposed to be euthanized. There is not supposed to be a middle ground consideration that they go into homes or that they go to sanctuaries or that we come up with permanent placement for these animals. The law states that a licensed wildlife rehabilitator is supposed to care for these animals, release them within a certain amount of time, and if they're deemed unreleasable and cannot go back in the wild where they came from, those animals essentially are supposed to be put to sleep. But we're looking at looking past that. Many of us know the situation like I said, I'm currently in it and have been in it many times. Obviously, one option is, can we find placement for these birds as pets? Are they even more domesticatable and tameable so that they can become appropriate pets for somebody? Or are there sanctuaries that are willing to house them? Now, there are a lot of wildlife rescue organizations that absolutely will not take in pigeons, mainly by the sheer numbers of them. And here in New York City, 
We do have our wildlife hospital, the Wild Bird Fund. However, they take in probably 90% of their caseload as pigeons. So it would be overwhelming for a shelter in a sanctuary. It would be overwhelming to consider where all the unreleasable birds are going to go. So if we got into that situation, obviously you'd have to align yourself with a licensed wildlife rehabilitator or become one yourself and work with placement of these birds into permanent situations. We are obviously in the same situation with them as considering them an unwanted parrot. There is no place for them to go if we don't have a partnership with either a sanctuary or with either placement in a home with individuals that are willing to turn them into pets. Obviously, working with licensed wildlife rehabilitators, they can offer solutions, they can offer advice, but the needs in the shelter situation of taking in unreleasable birds also relate to the fact that they may be in shelter situations longer. And that puts more burden on shelter workers and volunteers, increases the cost of feeding and care, and it's essential that these animals, if they are in a situation where they believe the quality of life is such that they should not be put to sleep, we're left with one of two avenues, finding a home or sending them to a sanctuary that's willing to take them in. Now, shifting back to specific issues relating to the shelter itself, when we're looking at elaborating on key components of a space or key components of a home setting when we're taking in fosters, obviously as well, the number of different considerations that can stem from this main question. One of those obviously is space and caging. That's the fundamental basic for taking in a bird is a safe cage environment. We're dealing with situations in a shelter where hopefully a shelter is cooperated enough to allow the intake of birds, where are we gonna put them? Now we discussed some of this in previous webinars and some of this information is available online, but certainly we do have to consider having caging or an appropriate enclosure or a place for these birds to go that also includes considerations for quarantine. And we're gonna discuss quarantine further on in the webinar, but we have to consider is quarantine or a separate space for these birds even going to be possible when space is already limited, sometimes to only one room in a shelter. So we have to consider how we can set up a safe space. When we don't know a medical history, when we don't know any past history on a bird, we cannot have these birds together. For people who know birds, they know that they don't automatically just get along. It's not appropriate to put them or house them together with strange birds. It's not appropriate to put them together without quarantine periods. Those are all issues that we deal with in the shelter situation that are obviously easier said than done. So what are we looking at on sort of key components? We're looking at a safe place. We're looking at an area that may be separate from predators and loud noises that may be traumatic for these animals. Of course, as a practicing veterinarian, it's my experience that the majority of pet birds live in homes with dogs and cats. And the majority of these parrots don't necessarily have a high amount of fear or anxiety if they're around louder noises. Now, if we're talking about sick birds, that's a different situation, but a healthy parrot in and around noises, that's a fact of life of being in a shelter where there are hundreds of dogs barking and a situation where we don't necessarily have control over how to keep it quiet, but definitely a safe space away from predators. Once again, we'll talk a little bit more about quarantine as we move through, but anybody that has birds and anybody that's working with birds to take them into a shelter situation has to start with the basics. A safe room, a quiet area, a place where we can house these birds safely until we can move them through, and an area where we have people that are able to get to them and care for them and meet their day-to-day -day needs. Now, when we're talking about a home setting for foster care, the majority of these situations certainly are going to be people who are taking a bird in to care for it, ideally with the intent to find permanent placement or a permanent home for it. In this situation, it's along the lines of how do we care for a pet bird in our home? Housing, caging, funding for care, food, unexpected veterinary costs, all of these are considerations that come into play when we look at setting up a proper situation.
And building on that topic is a serious concern, is what happens if we need to accommodate for a large number of birds? For instance, when we deal with the all too common hoarding situation or these large scale seizures. And obviously this is gonna be a case by case basis and it's gonna be largely demographic and largely based on the availability. We're talking about taking in a large number of parrots, let's say a breeding facility or a hoarding facility or a situation that's considered neglectful or abusive and somebody can take in anywhere from 50 upwards of 150 parrots, including breeding pairs, sometimes chicks, nestlings, adolescent birds. And in a situation like this, it's very difficult. And going back to my first question, honestly, the real thing to decide is, can you really do it? Can you really house and care for and properly take in that number of birds? Most shelters and most facilities aren't equipped to do it. Most shelters and facilities couldn't do it if it was a dog or cat kind of situation. So when we're working on a smaller scale with birds, it's a very difficult situation. Could we actually ever do it? Do you have the space? Makeshift cages work, standard dog and cat, stainless steel cage banks work, pet carriers, dog kennels, any of these type of things as a temporary home, as long as they're escape proof based on bar spacing and they're able to be set up properly, may work as temporary housing and oftentimes in hoarding situations, that's what people have had to do. Standard plastic cat carriers or pet carriers, dog kennels, anything of the like may have to be used and sometimes, like I said, is the only option. Then the second part of the, the taking in a large scale hoarder situation, which may, like I said, be hundreds of birds, is can you then start coordinating yourself with um, other volunteers, an increased need for volunteer help, foster homes, moving birds through, getting these birds vetted and checked out? Can we set up a situation so that these birds can come in, be examined, identify any that are hurt, any that are sick, any that are in need of immediate serious medical care? And then do we have the ability to make that happen? Of course, then we're dealing with a large scale hoarding situation where we do have to make that really, really tough decision. When we have 100 unwanted or homeless birds, and we identify some that are seriously very, very sick, we have to start considering humane decisions at that point, which always get into talk of, of humane euthanasia for animals that are, are horrifically injured or in a terrible situation. Um, even if it steps before what we consider suffering, that has to come into consideration. And that means there have to be people willing and able to make those type of emotional and sometimes ethical decisions in dealing with that situation. And then of course we have to coordinate with veterinarians. We have to coordinate with volunteers that are able to provide medical care if we have birds in these situations. And of course this goes beyond the hoarding large intake. We have to have the cooperation and the ability to provide medical care for any birds that are in need in both the short term and the long term. That's a very complicated, very, very difficult situation. Certainly one of those we all can agree on, we wish never happened, but sadly it happens all too often, and not only with birds, but it becomes a very complex, very difficult issue. There are, once again, resources about dealing with that. There are people who are professionals who deal with the management of large-scale seizures and hoarding um, intakes, and there are means to reach out to people to get these situations somewhat under control under the umbrella of the fact that we can always help these animals, we can always do right, we can end suffering should we need to, and we can deal with how to take in these animals. Space, of course, being key in every one of the discussions that we have, and the ability to actually take these animals in and have a space to house them properly. Continuing on the same thread, and this was a, an important topic that came up a lot when people were asked to contribute questions to this, when we're dealing with setting up the shelter, space and issues of housing are big issues. Whether we're dealing with a situation where we're going to have to purchase or get donated bird cages of various sizes, shapes, and bar spacing, or whether we're dealing with having to put these birds in makeshift cages, like we discussed before, carriers and um, dog kennels, things like that, 
Or are we working with our standard shelter cages, considering those that you'd expect small dogs or cats to be kept in, a large stacked setup of stainless steel cages with single entry front doors where we're going to be housing the birds for temporarily, um, ca temporary care. Yes, they're less than ideal, but sometimes they're all we have. We don't have the ability to really fund pass through doors. We don't always have the ability to set up these shelters in the most sort of desirable way that we can that may certainly come in time. But what about dealing with a facility and, and taking care of the ambient conditions? How do we keep these birds comfortable? What do these birds need? I guess in some cases we're talking about parrots. Hopefully we're not talking about the intake of a large number of baby birds, baby birds that need to be hand fed, that need to be in incubators. That's gonna be a whole separate situation that hopefully a shelter isn't dealing with too much because that does sometimes run beyond the abilities of a shelter to care for. Certainly we're talking about adult birds. Most of these tropical birds as adults are more sort of temperature tolerant than people think. Though given the opportunity, these birds prefer it warm. We generally think comfortable home temperatures and then warmer. Most of these birds will tolerate even what we consider to be uncomfortably warm temperatures, but we have to consider that as well. We certainly don't want these birds in constant heat. More important is making sure we have a situation where these birds aren't getting too cold and aren't remaining too cold. Like I said earlier, a lot of these adult parrots will tolerate cooler temperatures than we typically think. What are we dealing with here? We're dealing with situations of space heaters. We're dealing with situations of fans and proper ventilation, which we know is really important for the health of all of us. How can we provide adequate ventilation, adequate hygiene, what are the most cost-effective ways to do that? And this largely becomes an individual shelter spacing, funding, and resource ability. Now, most dog and cat animal shelters, in my experience, will designate a room or an area for the birds. They're at least largely within a facility that should have heat, should have some degree of air conditioning. They may or may not have windows. Most of the time, they don't. But there may be the ability to put in a fan, and there may even already be exhaust fans in place all of which ideally are gonna save on needing to have any of this installed because most shelters aren't going to have the funding to equip an area for birds without either outside funding or a room that already has all of that to offer. So the most cost effective way is certainly gonna be a facility that already has the basics for temperature control. Secondary to that is volunteers able to assess the living conditions, abilities to fan and ventilate rooms, and obviously the ability to be able to provide proper heating to prevent it from getting too cold. And as I mentioned earlier in answering this question, hopefully we're not dealing with the very unique needs of newborns and young birds that are in the process of being hand raised and weaned, because that's certainly going to be a whole different issue for shelters to deal with and contend with in, in heating and caring for these birds. In general, Comfortable home temperatures to a little bit warmer and these birds should thrive. Birds that are sick or birds that may be unwell for any various reasons may need additional heat. Then we're looking at outreach to veterinarians or veterinary care people. We're looking towards help from the veterinary care people at the shelter, which we're going to touch on later, and certainly um, support from everybody to make sure that the birds are in a comfortable situation. I'll close this topic by basically saying, it goes back to the first question we started discussing, can you really do it? When we think about the ability to take these birds in a shelter, do you really have the means and the ability to provide a safe sanctuary for these birds? And have we considered everything that goes into that, including all the things we're talking about today? Dr. Pilney, I have a couple questions before we move out of the, the space issue. Um, one is, what are the concerns for combining uh, birds out of quarantine with small mammals? Um, if, if the shelter has just one kind of extra designated non-dog and cat room, what are some of the concerns that that might raise? You mean a shelter taking in small pet mammals and their exposure? Well, so so having the 
birds and the mammals sharing the same space. Is that appropriate? I think she said, yeah, she said rabbits and guinea pigs, like sharing the room with rabbits or guinea pigs. That's a common situation that comes up as well, and, and one that I'm directly involved with a lot as well is dealing with our dog and cat shelters that take in rabbits and the ability to provide an appropriate space for rabbit and other small mammals like guinea pigs um, and having the spacing with that. For the most part, if somebody needed to house those type of small mammals with birds, it's not going to be a large issue with, with disease transmission. There, there shouldn't be a huge risk between those species, if that's what the concern was. Obviously, a spacing issue is going to come up with that in dealing with, with having those birds and those small mammals housed together. But in the majority of shelters that are already doing this successfully, if there isn't the space to provide them their same, same room, housing birds with animals like rabbits, guinea pigs, and the like generally is not a big problem. It shouldn't be an issue. Most of those small mammals are quiet. They're not going to be an issue for, for you know, causing undue stress to these birds. And that, in most cases in a shelter, is not going to be a problem other than the amount of room and space they have in cohabitating those two species. Would there be any added um, uh, issues with reptiles or amphibians? Certainly reptiles and amphibians are, are going to be a, a whole separate world when we start talking about properly housing and heating and warming and keeping those animals. A caveat to that certainly is, is a lot of the small pet mammals like rabbits and chinchillas and guinea pigs are heat intolerant. These are animals that won't tolerate heat and excessive warmth. These are animals that we know need appropriate ventilation and actually given the choice, most of them like guinea pigs and chinchillas prefer it cooler. So that would be a consideration when we're having those animals together that we have to be concerned about an environment that's too warm. But specific to your question, reptiles is a whole different, whole different sort of heating, warming, lighting type of scenario. That's a separate situation. Now, in the short term, housing a reptile, let's say there was a bird room and they took in a bearded dragon and they set it up in a tank. As long as we're really careful with hygiene and we don't have other options, that should be less of an issue. Now, people have talked about disease transmission between birds and reptiles. If we're not intermixing animals, we're not sharing food bowls, we don't have any direct contamination. In the shelter situation with limited space, if we can provide that reptile its unique needs in its environment, it may be less of an issue and overall may be less of an issue if we're careful hygienically. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does that make sense and answer the question? Yes. And okay. it would outdoor enclosures be beneficial or provide any uh, relief in you know, restrictions of space? Outdoor enclosures would be amazing. I mean, certainly that would be um, bordering on a gold standard of any kind of housing any bird, um, certainly even a pet bird in your home. The ability to have a really safe outdoor enclosure where the animals can get fresh air, ventilation, sunshine, um, indoor outdoor runs like some of the permanent sanctuaries have set up where the birds can fly, where these in outdoor enclosures that may be connected to an indoor enclosure certainly would provide more space. It certainly would provide the ability for, for birds to be introduced and monitored and allowed to live in larger groups because it provides a bigger space. It also provides more room for these birds to be able to act a little bit more naturally and a little bit more normally. So in an ideal world, certainly if, if anybody could set up an appropriate outdoor spacing, paying attention to climate, paying attention to predators, paying attention to location, in most cases, that would be a really, really ideal type of thing to set up if it were possible. And do you have recommendations for what kind of flooring to have in that situation? There are recommendations that largely depend on the space and the environment. In most situations, if we're dealing with a shelter, I invite people to think along the lines of something like a dog run, an indoor-outdoor space 
that maybe has an inside part. We're thinking along the lines of disinfection, ability to clean, ability to keep the area disinfected between animals. So we're looking at um, poured sealed concrete, something that we can hose off and disinfect. We're looking at sealed. If people have ever had experience in facilities where they house laboratory animals for research, there are, are facilities that are set up not to have corners, not to have edges, not to have places where debris can get lodged. So there are waterproof paints that we can put on the ground and on the walls that help with um, disinfection, that help with lack of porousness, that help with the texture um, that are set up. Um, they, these are similar to when I was a veterinary student. We had some of these set up where we had um, an ideal type of, of, of enclosures for wildlife where there's a special sealant that you can put that's easy to clean, easy to disinfect. So we're dealing with a situation where what are we people commonly using? Certainly newspaper is easy to work with. If you can put a substrate down of newspaper, fold it up, change it out. And we start getting into issues with things that create bulk, like wood shavings, um, sand, dirt, that type of thing. That usually doesn't work. And it's probably the subject of a whole other discussion when you're designing outdoor enclosures. For the purposes of this discussion, a shelter is going to need to think about setting up along those lines of that indoor outdoor run type of mentality where the birds can go outdoors but they're in an environment where it's somebody can hose off scrub off disinfect easily clean maintain that facility without creating a lot of, of bulk garbage like bedding and shavings and have something that's disinfectable right well i'd say we have a few other questions but in the interest of time let's Let's keep it moving. And just to say, Dr. Pilony has said that he would respond to questions that don't get addressed today via email. So even if we don't get to your question, um, he, he's going to graciously take some time to, to address some of those later on. So I'd say let's keep going. Thanks. Thank you. Now we move a little bit away from space and we start getting into issues relating to safety and relating to biosecurity measures. And this is specific to, to a number of people's concerns with, with how is the shelter managing their staff and volunteers with respect to potentially contagious diseases. And I, I will keep this question short because I will touch a little bit more on it when we get to quarantine. But this is in respect to mixing species. In an ideal world, we don't do that. We don't have to mix species. We don't have to have birds with questionable or unknown backgrounds exposed to other birds. But as we all know, there is a huge interest in backyard poultry. A lot of people get into keeping some chickens in the backyard and they don't necessarily understand what they're getting into. And they're faced with the same decision as well. Issues related to noise, hygiene, concerns with care. Um, and then a decision to say, we've got some backyard poultry. We don't wanna keep these chickens. Now, what do we do with them? There aren't a lot of options when it comes to that. And if we're talking about a shelter or a rescue organization that's willing to take those animals in, hopefully they have the setup and the facility and have others of this kind where they could take those animals in. So my suggestion would be if, if backyard poultry, ducks, any of these kind of animals are going to be potentially taken in through that shelter, the best thing to do is already have resources to get these birds moved through to a proper environment where they have the proper food and the proper setup for animals that usually can be housed with others of their kind easier than parrots and to move them through safely and securely. And that ideally will avoid any issues relating to biosecurity. Now, when we're looking at an issue specific to if we do have to house them, once again, it comes down to spacing, quarantine, and personal hygiene, disinfection, keeping animals clean. Sometimes we don't have the opportunity for separate air spaces or even separate rooms. People need to get into educating themselves on how to work with biosecurity measures. There are great resources online through the USDA and some other websites that talk about biosecurity measures controlling infectious diseases. People can search for these online. Um, education is by far the key point in dealing with this situation. Understanding the risk of contagion, understanding how to control it, 
setting up protocol manuals, and this is time consuming and something people often overlook, but writing up protocols on how these situations are dealt with are key. Having volunteers, having shelter workers, having people understand what are appropriate disinfection protocols, how to work with certain animals, which animals to care for first, understanding how we don't transfer infectious disease or we don't transmit it further through other animals is really, really important. And the safety largely has to do with, as I said, education. Educating people on how to deal with biosecurity measures is going to be the only way to prevent it. The second part of setting up an, a protocol manual is going to be rules and regulations, which probably fit under those protocols, but making sure people understand there are certain rules and there are certain actions that they have to take to be really careful and to minimize this, even with respect to intermixing birds. And this goes beyond just those species where we worry can have potentially infectious diseases that they can share. It also has to consider them sharing it with each other. It has to do with concern about um, the large number of, for instance, one particular example, the number of viruses that poultry have that they could transmit to naive poultry. So it's about education, it's about protocols, and it's about setting up rules and training your staff and volunteers to know how to abide by those. Now, when we talk about getting into veterinary care and we switch sort of the scope, um, one of the concerns people always bring up is the importance of using a qualified avian veterinarian and how to locate one. And I want to address that on a couple key points. The first is what we mean by qualified avian veterinarian, and there's two ways to look at that. We either have an avian veterinarian who has decided they would like to become a specialist and has gone through the process of becoming board certified so that they can be listed and designated and utilized as a board certified avian specialist in both medicine and surgery. But there are many people, many veterinarians that work with birds that are not board certified, that are capable and are excellent at avian medicine. Maybe they don't have board certification, but they're qualified, experienced, knowledgeable, and they know what they're doing. What this really means is finding a qualified avian vet. One way to start is the website aav.org. That's the Association of Avian Veterinarians. They have a find a vet feature. You can go on their website and look for veterinarians in your zip code or in your city that are members of the organization. They don't have to be board certified to be a member. They're somebody who's obviously shown interest in avian medicine such that they join the largest um, avian veterinary group in the country and are listed as members. And you can start by tracking veterinarians down from there. The second part of this is word of mouth talking to dog and cat veterinary practices, finding out who sees birds in the area, talking to rescue groups, talking to sanctuaries, finding out who are those veterinarians that are capable, able, and most importantly, interested in working with a shelter situation. And so that gets us back to the importance now. If you're a shelter taking in birds, you need veterinarians that know and understand birds on some sort of advisory and availability um, council. Veterinarians working in shelters know dogs and cats. Some of them take it a step further and have some rabbit or small mammal knowledge. They may have zero avian knowledge and zero capability. And in some situations, the shelter vets may not have interest in learning everything about avian medicine just because the shelter they work in is going to start taking in birds. This is where you have to identify and align yourself with an avian veterinarian or veterinary hospital. And I'll extend this a little bit further to veterinary technicians. Certified veterinary technicians or veterinary technicians that know birds are going to be your next best source of medical contact for working with these animals. And some shelters have been very successful in utilizing veterinary technicians that work in hospitals that work with birds when the veterinarians are not available, these people provide an excellent resource and often are very interested in volunteering and helping, and they can offer a lot when a veterinarian is not available. Certainly, finding veterinarians that are willing to donate their time, willing to serve as advisors, willing to answer emails, willing to consult on cases is absolutely key and paramount. 
The experience level they have is contingent on what's available. Finding a veterinarian that could help advise on medical procedures, finding a veterinarian that knows and understands birds is doable, it's possible, and it's very, very important. One of those early steps when I keep saying, can you really do it? Can you take these birds in? Are you able to set up a shelter facility and properly care for them? One aspect of the planning and organizing is how do you align yourself with a qualified bird vet, bird vet staff, or a hospital, a facility that will volunteer, a facility that can give large breaks and huge discounts if possible, um, and the ability to use word of mouth, discussion, contacting other rescues, and the Association of Avian Veterinarians to really identify and find a veterinarian that'll help. Now, I've answered this question in the last, and, and just to reiterate some of the key points, um, if you can't find an avian veterinarian, then obviously we're going to default to whichever veterinarian is there to provide medical advice and care. Hopefully it's not more than just somebody who's licensed to be able to authorize medications, able to buy and administer them. Obviously we're dealing with a situation where an animal may be in pain and need painkillers. Largely this is going to come down to those running the avian shelter. We're going to need volunteers. We're going to need skilled, qualified people to make recommendation, and then we're going to have to manage health needs. Like I said in the last slide, outreach to veterinary technicians, veterinary nurses, other people who are actively involved, people who work in shelters, people who work in rescue groups, people who are available to advise and help are really going to be your only resources. It's going to be difficult to go online. It's going to be difficult to try to research this. Obviously, when there's no health care around and we're dealing with a sick bird, what do we do? Well, I generally identify four tenets of what we should be equipped to do. One, provide warmth and a comfortable environment. Two, fluid therapy and hydration. Three, feeding, which covers calories and nutrition. And four is time. And sometimes that's all we can offer a sick animal when we don't have veterinary advice. We don't have access to a large number of drugs. We don't have access to getting surgery. In the short term, we need to get these birds comfortable, fed, hydrated, kept warm, and do the best we can to provide short-term care. Don't underestimate reaching out to wildlife rehabilitators. Like I mentioned, licensed wildlife rehabilitators, wildlife facilities, wildlife hospitals, and wildlife sanctuaries may be an absolute resource, whereas they're focused on wild animals, they can still give you bird advice, they can still give assistance, and they may become a great resource and a great partnership. So it's really important to make sure that you reach out to those as well, because there are people there who often can advise. I'll say it for the 19th time, don't look past, I mean, always look beyond just the veterinarian and look to veterinary support staff and nurses and technicians as a wealth of information in helping with, with the care of these animals. Now, quarantine is a very important aspect. We're looking at key components of medical screening, which comes during or after or after quarantine plans are in place. And this in itself could be a very complex issue. To focus on the main points, we're looking at medical screening at intake. The absolute minimum needs to be a full, thorough, complete physical exam. This information is available through the Avian Welfare Coalition. It's been discussed in other, other topics. But we need to have somebody capable and qualified, ideally a veterinarian. It's not always. But somebody that's able to look this bird over, physical exam, and evaluate. Can they see? Can they breathe normally? Are there any obvious injuries, wounds, traumatic problems? Did they get hurt in transport? Do they have chronic injuries? Like Denise mentioned, our earlier webinar series touches on this and offers some more information that I'm gonna go into today. But certainly collecting any medical information, getting any history, any background, any information we can get on these birds when they come into the shelter as we try to formulate a plan beyond the physical exam. Sometimes a physical exam is all we can do. We can identify the bird does or doesn't need further medical care. We can identify that the animal is stable and should be set up in a quarantine area with food and water to now observe that they're eating and drinking and pooping and, and behaving like a normal animal. 
Of course, when we get into the second tier of medical screening, we're looking at things like diagnostic tests and screening for viruses and certain bacterial infections. We're looking at evaluation of fecal samples, fecal testing. This usually goes beyond the shelter setup unless the individual shelter has a protocol and has funding and has resources through partnerships with local veterinarians to be able to do this. Now, some shelters will try to screen the birds for infectious diseases. Some shelters have worked out the ability to work with a shelter, I mean, to work with a veterinarian through the shelter to be able to run some diagnostic screening tests to make sure that these birds aren't harboring viruses or infectious diseases. This may come down to actually looking at the animal and knowing if they show symptoms. This will also come down to the ability for um, that partnership with those veterinarians or the veterinarians in the shelter to actually offer screening. Of course, this comes down to money. Are the funds there? Is the money there? Do we have the ability to pay for these animals to be tested? Now, a lot of situations are allowing minimal testing. There's funding to make sure the birds don't have the more common diseases. One more commonly is psittacosis or chlamydia infection to make sure that their birds are not harboring that. Um, other situations put it on the adopter or the foster home to screen those birds. When somebody adopts a bird, then they're responsible for any additional testing or screening. It depends on the facility. My veterinary hospital takes in a lot of unwanted birds. We house them, we care for them. We then do a bare minimum amount of, of infectious disease testing to safely keep those birds in the hospital. And then an owner who adopts them from us has the option of further testing, authorizing that further testing and clearance before they take the bird home or at a later date. So it really just depends on the individual facility. And then getting into more specifics about quarantine, it's a really important topic. As we round out this discussion, because I see we're running close to out of time, basically quarantine information is available through certain websites and, and it's available through the link that you can see at the bottom, as well as a bit more of an extensive discussion in one of our previous webinars for reference. The basic quarantine protocols are very challenging in the shelter. The most ideal is a completely separate room where all new birds are housed away from any other birds so that there is zero exposure in the event that that bird is harboring or has any potentially infectious diseases that they can share, our goal is to avoid that from happening. The next best situation is no direct contact, not sharing food bowls, not co-housing birds, not allowing them to poop in each other's cages, limiting exposure to droppings, to using water bowls, anything at all that we can do to keep those birds isolated while we're monitoring. <clears throat> Quarantine, the term itself, derives from Latin for quora, which basically means 40 days. So the ideal is to give these birds a long enough time in isolation or isolated from healthy birds to observe if they are going to manifest any symptoms of illness or disease. In my opinion, we can shorten quarantine if we can do infectious disease testing, but infectious disease testing can cost hundreds of dollars and that may not be feasible in the shelter. Basically, what we need to try to do, keep these birds in an isolated environment, the other side of a room sometimes is all we have, maybe a different type of cage setup that's more enclosed, like a plastic carrier with limited availability for um, stuff to kind of blow out or for contagion. Observe these birds daily. Make sure they're eating, drinking. They don't show signs of illness. We need to have a protocol set in place that fits with your unique self shelter's abilities that allows you to try to practice quarantine. We've discussed the needs to keep wildlife or dom non-domesticated birds. We've discussed the ideal is to keep pigeons doves, ducks, geese, any of these birds from intermixing as well, while we try to incorporate any type of quarantine protocol. Now, some shelters have had to, for, for disease outbreak concerns or concerns with known infectious diseases, have to house these birds in separate places. Sometimes you can partner with a foster home that'll take bird, one bird at a time, quarantine them until they can be moved through. 
Sometimes it's a matter of having to keep those birds in the non-bird area, like a hallway or another facility, maybe in a room that's quiet where it's there's a, an area, say it's a, a room where they keep rabbits and guinea pigs or even a room where they keep cats. If there's a concern about the transmission of infectious diseases, the goal here is to do everything to, we can to make sure we're not on the receiving end of disease transmission. Now, ideally, birds that come into the shelter, if they have any past medical history or medical records, they're going to have information that may include previous infectious disease screening, which is a really valuable resource. Quarantine is time consuming and it adds more work, but it's really, really important. And it's absolutely something that each shelter has to think through, plan what works best for your situation, try to come up with a protocol, write up that protocol, educate, train, teach people to understand it and be able to implement it. Now this page shows some additional resources. There are some links here. This information is all available online. Denise had mentioned um, the Avian Welfare Coalition has a manual with links. The Global Federation has a link to their education page. Please utilize these resources. Please utilize this information. There's a wealth of, of material that you have at your fingertips that can help support you through this challenging endeavor. I just wanted to mention on that uh, slide previously, there is um, a guide for performing a basic physical exam on captive birds, which Dr. Pilney uh, had written. Um, that is also available online, and that's a really, really great resource for um, a shelter vet who may not be familiar with birds because it guides them through the entire uh, examination of what they should be initially looking for. And uh, supportive care, of course, uh, for a bird that may look like he's under the weather. Uh, all of these are available online uh, and using those links. And they're downloadable, so you can download them and send them out throughout the shelter. <laughs> Great. Thank you for pointing that out. And as we, <laughs> and as we wrap up sort of the, the discussion here and, and going through this, obviously we all know, as it states here, we're the caregivers for these birds. If we're entering a venture of having a shelter, start welcoming unwanted birds. We have to think through everything that it takes to adequately execute that, including space allocation, commitment, time, effort, work, funding, and energy, because we're never going to rec replicate the environment that parrots live in. We're not going to be able to ever give these captive birds what they need. So we have an obligation. We're trying to look towards solutions, not harp on the problem. We're trying to look at how to make a bad situation better instead of just look, focus on, on the limitations. I hope the information herein is useful and helpful. I realize that an hour is not a lot of time to really expand on all of this, but this is an ongoing process. This is open for lots of discussion, for further evaluation. I foresee future webinars, discussions, and any other information that we can all work toward so that there's a global cooperation, global resources, and the ability to really do right by these birds. I know we all agree we find it very sad that we deal with such a problem of unwanted pets in this country, unwanted pets in the world. Um, it doesn't look like a problem that's going away anytime soon, so let's all just really work together and really try to make it a better place for these birds. I thank you very much for your, your time and listening. And I'll leave it for the, the um, others if they have any other last comments. Thank you, Dr. Pilney. Um, I, I can't tell you how, how wonderful it is working with you and um, all of the uh, cooperation that you've given us to um, educate on this issue. Kelly? Right. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to, yes, thank Dr. Pilney, but also remind people that um, we will have a second in this, in this series um, forum next Tuesday, a week from today, with a, another professional uh, expert, Dr. Laura Leitovich, and she will be addressing issues about um, issues that are existing now. While you already have your system in place, 
medical issues, how to handle animals, behavioral issues. Um, these are the kinds of questions that we're wanting to solicit right now. So if you go back on the same page, um, the avian education page on GFAS, there will be the second of the series, and you can register through that same uh, at that same page, different mm -hmm. link, but make sure you register for next week's, and you know we'll continue our discussion about you know all the issues that are relevant to keeping uh, avian uh, species safe in our shelter. So um, thanks again for everybody that participated and came today, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a great Bye. day. Bye. Thanks, everybody.